It all started for me with one question. What is happening in the brain of a child with ADHD? I wanted to know this because my child, my oldest son, had been diagnosed with ADHD. I had a background in neuroscience, and I didn't believe it was a behavioral issue. I believed it was a brain issue. And I wanted to know exactly what that was before I could actually try to help him. First concept I came across was something called unevenness of skills, which basically says that kids with ADHD don't struggle with everything. In fact, they might be advanced or even gifted in certain areas of their brain while they may struggle in others. This is true for all neurobehavioral disorders, aut autism, OCD, dyslexia. They often show genius level skills. After 10 years, I published a book on my uh, research and in that, I answered the primary question, but along the way, I also developed a unique approach, not only to help my son, but to also help many other people. In the early 90s, all of the brain research was looking at a problem in something known as functional connectivity between networks. I discovered that the primary problem was something known as a functional disconnection syndrome, which simply put, is an imbalance between the two hemispheres of the brain. There's no pathology, genetic mutation, or uh, any other injury to the brain. It is a developmental maturational imbalance that's superimposed on genetic traits and what we call cognitive skills. The people that are most susceptible to these imbalances happen to be those that are often the most gifted. The human brain is asymmetric or lateralized. All brains are. This gives us a great advantage. It actually almost gives us two brains in one. It allows an animal to use their left brain to actually focus on food while at the same time being aware of predators. Humans have the most lateralized brains. And what we see is that both hemispheres are designed to work together perfectly in synchrony and in balance. If they don't, they can cause a whole host of symptoms, especially behavioral and mental health symptoms. In fact, when you look at many of these symptoms in conditions, they don't seem to make sense. You have people that are so gifted in so, some areas and struggle in others. The only way it makes sense is actually when you look at it in light of brain asymmetry. So let's look at that. Let's start with the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere develops first and in the womb for the first three years. And the right hemisphere deficit issues are things like ADHD, OCD, Tourette's, tics, autism spectrum, schizophrenia, anorexia, attachment disorders, and more. The right brain is more sensory-based. It pays attention, especially to early sensations like pain, um, hunger, thirst, fatigue. And it also integrates the senses. So if there's a problem here, we call this sensory integration disorder. The right brain pays attention. And so any attention deficits, as in ADHD, are usually related to a right hemisphere delay. The right hemisphere looks at the big picture. It looks at the context. It sees everything all together. And it also controls the big muscles of early development, posture, what we call proprioception. If we have a delay here, this is kids that have problems with early motor development. They may be clumsy, awkward, have poor balance, low muscle tone, and what we call discoordination disorder. The right hemisphere is the nonverbal side of the brain. It, communicates through nonverbal communication. That means the ability to read somebody's facial expression, body posture, tone of voice, and to be able to communicate without words and know what they're thinking and what they're feeling. This is related to the social brain or the right brain socialization skills, the ability to connect with other people. And any problem with socialization is really a problem with nonverbal communication and right hemisphere development. This is also because the right brain is embodied. It connects to our body. We become self-aware. We get what we call body ownership in the right brain. And this is intuition. This is gut feelings. But it's also being connected to our own feelings and our own body so we can empathize with somebody else's feelings. If we don't feel a feeling, we can't even conceive of somebody having that feeling, much less be able to understand it. This is all about eye contact. This is what eye contact is about. When someone doesn't have eye contact, this is because they don't have nonverbal communication and they're not getting this. The right brain is about attachment. In humans, one of the keys to survival 
is to attach first to our parents and then to other people. Ancient humans could not survive alone. So this is really life or death. Forming relationships with other people is an innate drive that's in us all. And if a child doesn't have that drive to go out and connect with other children, it really is a right hemisphere delay, and that's what's producing it. The right hemisphere is withdrawal behavior. It is what stops us. It's the break of the brain. It stops us from doing things that are potentially dangerous or things that are risky. If we have too much of that fear, then this can lead to anxiety. Too little and we have very, very risky behavior. We have the right brain liking what we call novelty, meaning the, the right brain doesn't like to do routines. It likes to do new things, create new ideas. This is the creative ideas or art or music that we see. But it also doesn't like to do the same thing over and over. So it stops us from doing repetitive behaviors, things like OCD, tics, stims, hyperactivity. It stops those things. The right brain is also about emotions, but what we call negative emotions, withdrawal emotions, fear, sadness, too much fear and sadness, and this is anxiety and depression. And we see that there's also the emotional intelligence in the right brain, so that we have a sense of consciousness, conscience, morality, what is right, what is wrong. And this is shame, guilt, embarrassment. Some people don't have any shame or guilt or embarrassment or really understand right or wrong. This is sociopaths or psychopaths. Um, some people feel too much shame and guilt and they're overwhelmed along with sadness and this is major depressive disorder. The right brain does what we call reality testing. It says this is real or it's not. If we lose touch with reality, that's psychosis, hallucinations, delusions, schizophrenia. The right brain learns through implicit memory, subconsciously. We don't remember most of what we learn, or we don't know that we learn it with the right brain, especially in the first three years of development, which is when we're learning social skills and nonverbal communication. So if someone doesn't learn that, they don't know they don't learn it, and they don't realize that other people do learn it. So if they can't get along with other people or other people can't connect with them, they don't understand it and it can be very hurtful. And this is the way a lot of people on the autism spectrum feel all the time. And it's not their fault. The right brain is about big picture skills, reading comprehension, the main idea. We have some kids that can actually read before the age of two. That's called hyperlexia and you only see it in autism. And yet, when they get older, they can't comprehend what they read because they can't put it all together into the big picture. The right brain is about gut regulation. We digest our food. We absorb our food. The parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest system, allows us to feel safe and allows us to sleep. If we have a right hemisphere delay, we have problems with gut digestion. We may develop what's called a leaky gut. We have malabsorption. We may have constipation. The child may always be in a state of fight or flight, and therefore they can't rest. They can't sleep at night. We see that the right brain also suppresses the immune system, so it doesn't overreact to things that really don't want to cause it harm, like certain foods. After three years, we see that the left hemisphere is now kicking in. And left hemisphere deficits are things like dyslexia, learning disabilities, processing those disorders, depression, bipolar, rejection, sensitivity, dysphoria. The left brain is all about details. It breaks the world up into small pieces. It lines it up all in a row, looks at it linearly, sequentially, looking for a pattern to predict where that's going to go. And it does it over and over. The left brain is all about the small picture. It is focused on symbols, letters, numbers, static things. The left brain also loves familiarity. It loves to do the same thing over and over and over. It loves routines. So too much of this is OCD. The left brain also controls motor activity, especially initiation of motor activity. Too much initiation of motor activity, and these are things we call tics or stims, hyperactivity, Tourette's, vocal tics. The left brain also controls what we call motor planning, which is being able to sequence small muscles rapidly, like handwriting or typing. If we have a problem here, this is called dyspraxia or dysgraphia. The left brain, the most complex motor planning that it does is verbal language. Everything verbal is primarily on the left side of the brain. The left side of the brain uh, controls expressive language, 
receptive language. If there's any problem with things like stuttering, articulation, or language delays, this is a left hemisphere issue. If there's hyperconnectivity of something called the arcuate fasciculus on the left side, this is echolalia or scripting. The left hemisphere is about approach behavior. It's about seeking something. We see kids that are hyperactive. They're constantly moving around. They don't sit still. They're looking for something. What are they looking for? The left brain is goal-directed. It sets goals. It pursues goals. And it is motivated to continue going after those goals. If someone has difficulty setting a goal, pursuing a goal, creating habits, or they lack motivation in general, this is a left brain delay. Too much motivation is what we call mania. Too little motivation is what we look at as depression. The left brain is about emotions as well, but what we call positive emotions, joy, happiness, pride. Too much joy and happiness is also connected to mania. Too much pride is what we look at as narcissism. The right brain also controls anger, which is actually a positive emotion. It gets us to keep going in the face of frustration. But if we have too much activity on the left, we see that little things that frustrate a child may lead to big meltdowns or tantrums or anger management issues later on in life. The left brain learns through uh, what we call explicit memory. It memorizes things. Anything you learn consciously, you do with the left brain. If we can't do this, then this can lead to memory problems or learning disabilities. We also see that the left brain is academic and intellectual, especially things like math and science and engineering. If someone struggles with academics because their left brain is delayed, this may be things like dyscalculia, math issues, or learning disabilities. The left brain is what we call the sympathetic fight or flight. And as we said, this reduces gut function. This uh, also keeps people up at night and also makes them feel like they're perpetually in danger. This can lead to anxiety as well. The left hemisphere does immune activation. It activates the immune system to fight off infections. But if it's overactive, which is what we often see in right hemisphere delays, they may be hypersensitive when there's a leaky gut to foods and create sensitivities to things like gluten or dairy can trigger things like eczema, allergies, asthma. These are just a few small examples. I could go through dozens more, but you get the idea that all of these conditions and symptoms can be explained by overactivity of networks on one side of the brain combined with underactivity of networks on the other. But the main question and what's unique about my work is, what are you going to do about it? How do you change that? How do you balance the brain? And there's three things I've found. One is you need to identify and address whatever's holding back brain development. Two, we need to be able to use a combination of different types of brain stimulation tools and direct them towards specific networks together. Three, we need to be able to do all of that directed towards the underdeveloped and underactive networks on one side of the brain. We need to address the imbalance. If we just do generalized stimulation, we don't address the imbalance and we actually may make it worse. So it all starts with movement. Movement is what created brains. Movement is what helps develop the child's brain. And the brain builds from the bottom up. It starts in the brainstem, works up, builds the brain, comes down and top down regulates everything and every system in our body. This is called vertical integration. Anything that affects this is called bottom up interference. At the same time, we need to integrate and differentiate the hemisphere. So this is called horizontal integration. Anything that interferes with this can interfere with this process. The thing that interferes with it the most is what we call early motor sensory developmental issues. What creates those? One of the things that our lab has focused and published a lot of research on is something called retained primitive reflexes. Primitive reflexes are the foundation of movement and brain development. And we're all born with these and it allows the child to, in, to move and interact with the world, engage their senses, and be able to build their brain in the first year. But at the end of the first year, they need to be integrated or inhibited. If not, they'll hold back development of the brain and the other side of the brain will come online too early and that will further hold back the brain. And this never self-corrects. So what we need to do first is we need to address movement. We need to work with big muscle movement. We need to do core stability, muscle strengthening, improve muscle tone. We need to do things with postural adjustments to correct for head tilts or body tilts, which skew the way we see the world. 
we then can do direct stimulation, tactile stimulation, to activate these reflexes over and over again on one side more than the other. We can then do developmental movements to be able to reproduce these reflexes to ultimately inhibit and integrate them. We can then do balance exercises on one side to work on proprioception. We can do eye movements in specific direction, directions and locations directed towards one side of the brain. We can spin somebody and activate the inner ear on one side to activate the opposite side of the brain. We can use sound in one ear at different frequencies, high frequency for the left, low frequency for the right. We can use music for right brain and left brain. We can do it louder in one ear than the other. We can use light and we can flash it in one eye and we can do that at different frequencies that literally can change the frequencies of networks. We can use different colors and different colored lenses. We can do direct stimulation to the brain to activate one side, inhibit the other. We can block a hemifield of vision, so only allowing vision to get into one side of the brain. We can do smell in one nostril or the other, right brain smells and left brain smells. We can do things called ry rhythmic training or metronome training to help synchronize and coordinate both sides of the body, which helps coordinate and synchronize networks in the brain. We can do virtual reality or video games that can be directed towards the right or the left. We can do neural feedback directed towards specific networks. We can do academic training towards the left brain or the right brain, word reading or reading comprehension. We can do cognitive skills like working memory on the left and attention on the right. We can do all of these in combinations and we can individualize it to the individual person. In my office, we've been able to use brain scans, hundreds of them, to show and identify these imbalances and also show when they are corrected. Harvard Medical School, McLean Hospital, the number one mental institution in the United States, is an independent study of my work. They did a 15-week study on ADHD kids. They did advanced brain, brain imaging before and after, and they showed physical and functional changes in the brain consistent with what they said was my theory that brain balance by removing bottom-up interference, by integrating reflexes, and then specifically stimulating the underdeveloped right hemisphere would stimulate growth and maturation in the right side, helping to restore synchrony between networks. This would promote integration and it may dampen activity that may have been overactive in the left hemisphere, creating a balance between these areas. I believe that learning how to balance the brain may want to be one of the most important things anyone can do for their mental, mental and physical health. We have shown that we can teach anybody to understand and balance their own brain or their child's brain. And I believe we can make the most impact by putting this information into the hands of people to help themselves and their child, not to change them, but to allow them to become the best version of themselves, to reach their full potential and live the best quality of life. Thank you.